Hello everyone, welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. I have the great Mike Dolce here with me today. Thank you all who sent in your questions. We're going to jump right in it. I got all your questions here. I'm doing the top ranked questions first. And the top number one question you guys liked the most was protein or carbs immediately after workout for building muscle. What's the best thing to ingest after working out? Protein or carbs if you want to build muscle. Mike? Easy answer. So here's what you want to do. Pre and intra workout, that's before the workout starts and during the workout, you want to be sipping on a grass-fed whey protein isolate. So the amino acids are already in the bloodstream immediately post-workout. That's where you want to hit those carbohydrate sources. What we like to do is we like white jasmine rice as the go-to all-natural carbohydrate source. We tend to stay away from those carb powders and whatnot due to digestibility. So we have the, the jasmine white rice, and what we'll even do, I have a little coffee grinder, bean grinder. We'll take the jasmine white rice, we'll blend it down, put that in the coconut water, a few blueberries, mm. blend it up into a shake, and bang that. How much jasmine rice? Um, let's, say, guys, let's say we're 170. 170, half to three quarters of a cup post-workout. And 45 minutes later, you want a well-balanced meal. Usually, we'll do a chicken breast, a lean meat. We stay away from the fat again within that 60 minutes post-workout. Fat slows digestion. So we'll do like a little bit of chicken breast, six ounces of chicken, and we'll do another cup of white rice. Amazing. Next question. This one's from Blue Dog. Everyone says the decline of Johnny Hendricks was because of the USADA crusade. But I can't help but notice it's right around the time he stopped working with you. Well, now, John, Johnny, after you fought George, hasn't looked the same. Yeah, I, I agree. And me personally, what I think, and I thank you for, for giving me that, that credit, um, I think Johnny never refocused his goals. I know Johnny's goal from the time I started working with him before the John Fitch fight was to fight the great George St. Pierre and defeat the great George St. Pierre. After that fight, after losing that split decision, um, I, I think Johnny never reset his goals. He never refocused. And you saw a pretty large decline in his, his training. He had, you know, I don't want to say lackluster performances, but he had a varied um, performance spectrum. And I just don't think he ever reset his goals. And I did actually leave uh, Johnny not long after. So after the Robbie II fight is when I stopped working with Mr. Hendricks. And then from there, you could see, I think, an even greater decline. I just think he never reset his goals. Interesting. <clears throat> um, next one here is from uh, Saraf. Saraf asks, Ketogenic diet versus it intermittent fasting, the differences between the two, and which one do you prefer and why? What? Neither. Neither. Saraf. So, uh, here's the thing. So the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting, they're both exclusionary diets focused on calorie deprivation. We don't want to be doing that. What we do is we can want you, to... Sorry, can you explain what ketogenic, for those who don't know? Sure. It's ketogenic. So the, now there's two different things. A ketogenic diet is a diet that only allows you to eat 20 grams of carbohydrates or less per day. And the inference is that you will actually attain the metabolic state of ketosis. But that's not true. Most of the ketogenic diets on the market are flawed. They are fraudulent simply because you will not attain the metabolic state of ketosis. Therefore, you're simply following a low or a very low carbohydrate diet, which is not ideal for the average healthy adult, definitely not ideal for any sort of athlete. I don't care if you're training three days a week in the gym. You do not want to be following a ketogenic diet, nor will you attain the metabolic state of ketosis. So we wipe that off the table. We talk about a carb-controlled diet. You want to be eating the right carbs at the right time to fuel your body for the next bout of exertion. Whether it, it's you know MMA training over at TriStar Gym, or you're, you're lifting weights with your strength coach, or you're, you're just going through your average day picking up your kids and going grocery shopping. We need that stored glucose, stored glycogen in the muscle and in the lever, liver to be expressed as glucose later on in the day. Now, glycogen is site-specific. It's much more readily available than ketones, these free-flowing ketones. That is not the ideal energy source, and I'll take that further. The body actually has a built-in hack. It's called gluconeogenesis. When you're eating a very low-carbohydrate diet, the body will have a need for glucose. So what happens inside the liver, the body will start to convert protein via amino acids into glucose. That shows that our body prefers glucose and it knows that glucose is the primary, the most efficient fuel source. That being said, we don't do keto. None of my athletes have ever done keto. And, you know, respectfully, our athletes are always in shape. They're always on weight. And they always look like they could walk onto a bodybuilding competition stage. So whether you want to be lean, whether you want to live long, whether you want to perform at world-class levels, we need those carbohydrates, but it's the right carbs. 
no synthetic chemicals, no processed carbs. Now, intermittent fasting, again, and I said this a year ago when keto came out, those who follow what we do, our system, the ketogenic diet was simply a calorie reduction diet. You're eating the same basic calories that you were minus the carbohydrates, so you dip into this calorie deficit. That's why people lose weight at first. And then what happens is the body composition ratio starts to shift. We see, yeah, I've lost weight, but I still look the same or I look worse. Skinny fat syndrome sets in, and now you're no longer hitting personal records in the gym. You don't have the energy to perform. And this is where the supplement companies come in and they start selling these exogenous products. It makes no sense that you have to take an exogenous synthetic chemical to replace the energy that you would have gotten from a whole food source. What we say is earth grown nutrients or whole foods have sustained all of life on the planet since the dawn of time. It never makes sense to me why, would you, why you would resort to a synthetic chemical, an exogenous product, a processed product in order to replace what was naturally here. So intermittent fasting, again, it's just shutting that calorie window, making us eat less total calories, again, falling deeper into a calorie deficit. Now the big craze is a six hour fueling window. I'm a 202 pound guy. There's no way I can take in my 3,200 total calories per day in six hours and have proper digestive efficiency. What does that mean? That means if I'm taking in 1,200 calories per meal, 1,600 calories over two meals, my body cannot digest, absorb, and utilize those calories. Therefore, I'm going to fall not just, not just into a calorie deficit, but a micronutrient deficit, and that's where the whole body falls apart. We focus on micronutrient density before we ever talk about macros. Macros are protein, carbs, and fats. I hope that helps. I know I went a little long there, but I think <laughs> we needed perfect. some context. That's perfect. Ketogenic, you don't like ketogenic diet. Nope. Intermittent fasting is no good. No good. Next question here is from Yuki. Yuki asks, this is a great question because it follows up on, on the on the first on the, on the previous one. Sure. What carbs would you recommend for athletes and fat loss? So what carbs are the best carbs for athletes and fat loss? That's a great question. Simple. We'll just talk about athlete carbs. So quinoa is one of our favorite mm -hmm. carbs. Um, white potato, sweet potato are great carbs. Steel cut oats and or oat bran are great carbs. Don't forget, green vegetables and fresh fruit contain carbohydrates, whether it's one, two, three, or four grams per serving per cup. You still add that up over you know, four or six meals per day, you're getting four grams of carbohydrates from your broccoli or asparagus times four or five meals per day, you're hitting 16 or 20 grams of carbs just from that green vegetable. All of a sudden, you've bounced out. You're no longer considered keto. One cup of blueberries is 21 grams of carbohydrates, approximately. One cup of blueberries, you're no longer keto. Nobody can say that a cup of blueberries is unhealthy for you except for the keto crowd, low carb crowd, unfortunately. So plant-based um, food sources are amazing form of carbohydrate, um, and that does include quinoa. So quinoa, amaranth, white rice, black rice, uh, rice, wild rice, white potato, sweet potato, those are all great carb sources, but we need to think about the timing, and we need to think about the quantity. We typically eat about half cup servings multiple times throughout the day, except the largest serving would be immediately upon arising or your first workout. We do a fasted form of list. We call it low intensity, steady state cardiovascular activity while fasted, which is in the absence of insulin. After that, we have our breakfast bowl, oats and berries and nuts and seeds. It's a carbohydrate bump. It's a fiber bump. It's a protein bump. It's essential fat bump. You're getting a lot of good nutrition to sustain you throughout the rest of the day. And then post-workout, like we said, with the jasmine and white rice, immediately after the workout and then 45 minutes later again. Those are the biggest bumps per day when trying to get lean. And all you need to do is simply pull those carbohydrates from your last one or two late night meals to improve growth hormone production while you sleep seven and a half to nine hours. That's when the body is really going to start to metabolize no that body fat. Right. No carbs at night, right? Lower carbs Lower. at night because we'll still eat veggies. But we stay away from those more complex carbs. We will have... Um, we'll do like a veggie omelet is one of our favorites. You know, you want to go to bed, you want to get lean. Veggies, peppers, and onions, and spinach, and mushrooms, and um, just, you know, uh, a kale and broccoli chopped up. Two or three whole eggs, you're ready to roll. So you do a lot of eggs, you? Uh, we do typically two to four eggs a day, depending on mm -hmm. body weight. Um, so it would be about maybe a dozen or so eggs per week maximum. So it's not a lot of eggs, but it's consistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question is from FPA. Eating every two hours or eating a few big meals a day, does it really matter? It matters based upon digestive efficiency. Though, so you know, people talk about the thermodynamics and, and you know how the body actually metabolizes the, the food. And food is is essentially a calorie is a measure of heat, right? So they, they talk about just heat and energy expenditure, and we can go deeper into that, but I'll bore you on this channel. 
what you want to focus on is what can my body digest? That's what we focus on. We eat every two to four hours based upon activity. What am I repairing from and what am I pre-fueling for? That's the way that we look at our foods. And I don't care about breakfast, lunch, and dinner or snacks and pre-workouts and post-workouts. I don't care about any of that. All we care about is fuel. Am I repairing? What do I need to replace from what I just did? Did I just have a really hard, high-intensity sprint or sparring session? I need to have vital micronutrients available to start to replenish the damage that we just did so the body can start to repair and rebuild. And also pre-fueling for the next two to four hours of expenditure, what do I need? What energy um, sources do I need available? What uh, do I need uh, amino acids available to start rebuilding that muscle tissue? But we're also thinking 24 and 48 hours into the future to have that, those nutrients readily available also. So it's based upon the individual. But then again, I like a minimum of a four time per day feeding session and they say they debate between what's better, three or six meals per day. It, it's the blend. Every two to four hours based upon your activity, that's the ideal. We don't do template programs. Every human is different. Everyone's physiology is different. Everyone's schedule is different. So we say every two to four hours based upon activity. All right. Marco Rado. Marco Rado asks, what should a fighter eat in the last five days of a weight cut? And what advice do you have for after the weigh-in meal? What, so after he weighs in, what's the best thing to consume? Great. So what does a fighter eat the last five days going into a weight cut? It's the same foods you've been eating the last three weeks, hopefully, and the last three months, hopefully. It's basically the same foods. Our weight cut starts 52 weeks before competition. We want lean, healthy athletes year-round. There is no off-season when it comes to health. The, year, the healthier you are, the easier the weight cut becomes. And what we simply do the last five days, we're just managing electrolytes. Hopefully, we're not changing calories at all. We're not dropping or reducing calories at all. It makes no sense to me why we should go into a calorie deprivation, caloric deprivation, on the eve of the most important athletic competition of your life. Why should you be suffering in such a, at a low, weak point? Right? And you have to perform the next day. You have to perform the next day. So that makes no sense. What we can simply do is we can focus on digestive efficiency, making sure that we're actually clearing the foods that we need. And what we typically do, let's say like a Mursad Bektik, who's taking in approximately 2,000 calories per day as a featherweight. What we simply do is we start spreading his meals out even farther. Instead of him having, let's say, five meals per day, we move it to six, then to seven, then to eight meals per day. So now smaller meals that are able to be digested more efficiently. Metabolism goes up. Metabolism goes up. Metabolism we clear up. that food matter. And then we play with the electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium. We really start to focus on the interplay, which is really sodium, potassium. We do not sodium deplete. What we do is we play with the ratio of sodium to potassium, which allows the athletes to lose water so easily. But then we build it right back up, which is your next question. Post weigh-in, what's most important? We back out of the weigh-ins the same way that we pull into the weigh-ins. It's fluids. It's electrolyte-dense fluids. Again, we're getting those electrolytes back in with proper fluid. We don't start eating pizzas and pastas and all these crazy synthetic chemicals, which makes no sense. We do no Gatorade, no Pedialyte, no sports drinks. That's respectfully, and I hope I don't affect any sponsors, that's not what you need to I do. I just lost half my sponsors. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's not that for us. I'm just kidding. But truly, we put the same ingredients back into the body that the body's been eating the entire time in the camp anyway because they're recognized. The digestive enzymes know what to do with them. And essentially, that comes down to Water, clean, purified water with electrolytes. Our electrolytes, sea salt, citric acid from, from fresh squeezed lemon. Uh, we, we get our sugar from raw local honey. That's ideal. That goes into our first, um, you know, maybe three or four liters even of water. And then we start to introduce fresh fruit and then easy to digest um, complex, more complex carbohydrate sources like white rice. And we slowly, as the digestive system turns on, we start to build out. We pay attention every 15 minutes to what our athletes doing, when they're urinating, how much they're urinating, what the color of the urine is, when their first bowel movement is, as their digestive system becomes more efficient, is how we start to load the body and rehydrate back up again. Amazing. <clears throat> Let me see here. What do you do to alleviate muscle pain after workouts? Um, soreness after workouts. Soreness. Intense workouts create soreness. What's the best way to combat that? Well... You want to make sure that you're warming up properly. You want to take the time to do a proper warm-up. We like dynamic warm-ups, so you do a dynamic warm-up to get the body. And that's kind of instead of static stretching, which is just holding, 
dynamic warm-up is, is, is kind of bouncing the muscle through its complete range, increasing elasticity. Then we roll into a sports-specific athletic warm-up. This whole thing takes maybe 15 minutes. Then you start scaling into your training for the day. And then we warm down coming out of the positions that we were in. We will focus on focus on, excuse me, some mobility work, and then we warm down the body to a full cool down. I like cold tub immersion if possible, or even a cold shower. Right after the workout, a lot of electrolyte enhanced water to make sure you have the proper electrolytes available. Most athletes miss this. They drink water, 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 water with no electrolytes, and that becomes dehydrating. So you have to understand the electrolyte component is necessary to stay adequately hydrated. The amount of water you drink is not good unless you have the proper electrolyte ratio. Massage once or twice a week if possible. Infrared sauna once or twice a week if possible. Cold water immersion almost after every workout is great. But also taking the time to to walk out in the sunshine. And, And this sounds a little odd, metaphysical maybe. You know, looking at the blue sky, breathing the air, letting the sun fall on your face, allowing the body to start to calm down and mentally you relax. Lower the stress level. Lower the stress level. That's exactly what it is. Absolutely. Um, Mike Goldberg asks, why does Khabib have such a hard time cutting weight? Oh, I could I could talk on many ways, and I could be very, very uh, critical, and I'm not going to be. I'm going to be respectful. Um, it makes no sense to me why Khabib has had so many problems. I think there's a severe flaw in his system um, in doing that. An athlete being hospitalized, going into the most important athletic event of their career, makes absolutely no sense. It's the extreme level of unprofessionalism. Two-part contract, make weight fight, right? So you don't um, adhere to one of those parts of the contract. It's unprofessional. I don't know for sure. I'm not behind the scenes, but I would say that there was this massive mistake, a big flaw in that system, and unfortunately, his health suffered. To hear the stories is really scary, but I don't know for sure, so I can't say. This is a great question. Yes. Okay, this one is from uh, Dennis. Yes. What is the best for breakfast? What is the best thing to eat for breakfast before training, and how many hours before bre- how many hours before training should you have your breakfast? So you're working on it in the morning. Let's say you're working on it at 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. Yeah. How many hours before should you have your breakfast? And what breakfast should you eat? Great question. Part of our morning ritual, what we try to get most of our clients to do, whether it's pro athlete or just regular layperson, is to get up and move their body in some sort of way. So we wake up, we start to hydrate with room temperature water. And then we want to move the body, get the blood flowing a little bit, and also start to engage the mind. I like to go for a walk, and we suggest going for a walk. We're we're bipedal organisms as human beings. Getting out and walking outdoors, if possible, is ideal. This also is called LIS, what I said earlier. Low intensity, steady state cardiovascular activity has been proven to oxidize a greater level of gender-specific stored body fat, the stubborn body fat, in the absence of insulin. So what does that mean? That means approximately between 100 and 110 beats per minute. We're working at a rate that we're still in the aerobic threshold. We haven't switched over into the glycolytic threshold, which is now the body starts to pull glycogen. We don't want to pull glycogen because now we're no longer burning body fat. You see in the treadmills, it says 130 to 150 or so is the ideal fat burning zone. That's completely flawed. That's wrong. We want to keep that much lower at a pace in which that you can talk or sing the entire time. We try and get our client, make some phone calls, you know, sing on your iPod, whatever it is. Walking at that pace. Then we come home and we have what we call our breakfast bowl. That would be oats, that would be berries, that would be chia seeds and hemp seeds and cinnamon, um, maybe some sort of almond butter or peanut butter, um, coconut flakes maybe. That's when your first carbohydrate dump comes in, knowing that you're going to be training later on that day and we want and need more of those vital macronutrients supported by a wide array of micronutrients. Now, the best time would be approximately 60 to 120 minutes before that training session based upon your own individual of physiology. How well does this food digest for you? For me, that's right about 90 minutes. About 90 minutes it takes for me to fully digest my breakfast bowl, which is about 800 or so calories, one of my biggest meals of the day, but it digests very efficiently. Same thing with Mursad, and Mursad, we're here for Mursad, so he's easy to talk about. He'll have his breakfast bowl somewhere about 90 minutes or so before training, so you eat it the first 30 minutes, you feel just a little tad full, you feel satisfied, 60 minutes or so you feel normal, 90 minutes you're almost starting to get hungry again, and I like to train, and I like our athletes to train feeling just a a little bit hungry. That means that the blood flow is no longer in the digestive system. Now the blood flow is usable again to support um, and fuel those working muscles. And that's the big mistake. Athletes eat too soon to training 
all the blood pools to the stomach because blood is primary to digestion. It's no longer available you to feel food. lightheaded. You feel like, uh, you know, it's the worst feeling. Overeating before practice is a huge mistake. It's better to be underfed than overfed. Now, if you fall into that, oh, it's a little short, you need a little bit, maybe you have a blood sugar sensitivity. What we'll do is say, eat a whole orange, a simple sugar, it'll perk you up immediately, and maybe a quarter to a third of an avocado. That avocado gives you a slow, sustained form of energy. It improves satiety so you don't feel really hungry and you get the simple sugar to keep the body working. And that will get you through a good 60 or 90 minute training session. Great question. That was a great question. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, here's a dangerous question. You should be very careful. Uh-oh. Very dangerous question here. Here it comes. Um, you might get a death threat, so be careful. I get them all the time, believe it or not. It's crazy. What is your opinion on the vegan slash vegetarian diet? Well, that is a good question, and it could be dangerous, but um, I'm glad to be answering because 90% of my diet is plant-based. 90% of the food that we suggest is plant-based. I'm a 200-pound guy. I eat four ounces of meat at any given sitting, no more. So I see people eating six and eight and 12 ounces of meat in this carnivore diet, this all-meat diet. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Meat to me is simply, it's an amino acid, all right? It's like, I'm, you know, respectfully like the Terminator. When I see food, I see what the micronutrition is. I see the breakdown. For me to eat more than four ounces of any animal product makes no sense because four ounces of steak is 20 to 30 grams of protein. On my plate, I'm going to have another 20 to 30 grams of plant-based proteins. There's no reason for me to be eating more than 40 to 60 grams of protein at any given meal. Most people discount the amount of amino acids, protein essentially, that comes from plant-based sources and we focus on complementary proteins from plant-based sources. So you need two or three different types of plant-based sources to come up with a complete array of essential amino acids. We make sure we have three or four or five different plant-based sources on our plate on every meal and just a little bit of protein. Two or three eggs at any given meal is, is ideal for me. Four ounces of steak or chicken or fish is ideal for me. And usually we have half of our meals are completely plant-based, no animal proteins. Now, I'm a meat-eating savage. I'm not saying I'm a vegan, but I know the, the power of plant-based sources. Again, they're earth-grown nutrients. And then if you do eat animal sources, we always suggest getting wild-caught. That would be ideal from a health perspective, from an ecological perspective. Philosophically, I, I would say that, that that's a, a better perspective. You don't want these animals that are suffering. You don't want to be a part of that. So try and find a local hunter or co-op that you can actually throw them a few hundred dollars and they'd be happy to bring you some wild caught. Generally though, too much flesh food, you feel sluggish, no? You feel sluggish. The bodies, we're not made to break down that much flesh at one time, people, no matter what these hacks say. People in North America eat way too much meat. Yeah. Like it's ridiculous. The amount of meat people eat, you'll feel so much better if you minimize your meat. Like four, three to four ounces, a deck of cards maximum, especially if you're training. Because if you eat a big steak and you go train, uh, you're going to feel sluggish. You're not going to you're not going to have a great workout. No, and that's no, it's going to slow you down. We lead the world in heart disease, we lead the world in all cause mortality, we lead the world in lifestyle related illness. There is a direct correlation. Absolutely. Kevin asks, if you had to eat just five vegetables for the rest of your life, what would they be? I don't like these questions. I don't like these just pick one or what's the limit. best. Can't limit. What we say is we eat a wide variety of local organic um, earth-grown sources. So whatever's local in your geographic region, whatever's in season right now, that's what you want to be eating. Every grocery store I go to, I know the name of my produce manager. I know the na name of my butcher. I know the name of the fishmonger. And uh, Dave, what's up, man? What's fresh today? What just came in this morning? What still has dirt dripping off of it? That's what I want to eat. What did you, what's wild? What just came off the dock? And that's what I'm buying today. That's how we make the menus in my house. I don't just say, well, today I have to eat salmon. I'm going to go get the frozen salmon. No, there's, there's you know, maybe wild uh, caught line caught tuna at our butcher today. That's the one that I'm pulling. So whatever's as local, whatever's natural, whatever's in season, whatever is the least molested by man, that's the one you want to be consuming. You want fresh and you want variety. That's why the wider there's variety. No, there's the no better. top five. No. There's no top five. Nope. All right, uh, next one here is, what foods favor HGH and testosterone? Thanks for us. Thanks, Mike. That's from Petrus. What foods favor? HGH. Like if you want to, you know what, you want to eat a, yeah. uh, you want to optimize your testosterone levels. Okay, and it's not going to be food, actually. It's going to be lifestyle. Sleep is going to be one of the most important. Mm -hmm. Sleeping seven and a half to nine hours per night, that allows your body to produce the maximum amount of um, hormones that you can, whether it's testosterone and or growth hormone, depending on your age and, and, and you know, your physical uh, makeup. The next one is training intensity. does matter. You want to trade at very high intensities for very short bursts. We suggest high intensity training no more than 45 minutes. 
you can train whole, if you train super hard for 45 minutes or, or more than 45 minutes, you're probably not training hard enough. Little warm up, little cool down, but the meteor training, that's about maximum. Minimizing stress is huge. We all neglect this. Mm. Pay your bills on time. Give your wife a hug and a kiss when she's not expecting it. Hold the door for strangers. Smile and say hello. That's a big, big factor most people neglect. Shut off politics and TV and all that nonsense. Open a book. Minimize that stress, internal, external stress in your life. Those are the bigger areas, much bigger than food. And then I'm going to suppose, I'm going to assume that you're eating a, a diet that is very rich in earth grown nutrients with wide variety. You'll be fine with that. Awesome. Does coffee help or worsen athletic performance? Well, coffee. Take a sip of my coffee here. <laughs> you feel more athletic. Coffee helps. Coffee helps most people as long as you don't have a sensitivity to coffee. Some people do. It makes them just hyper stimulated, which takes them out of that performance zone. Now, caffeine will take away the coffee. Their caffeine, caffeine itself, has been shown to be an ergogenic aid. It has been shown to increase performance at a specific dose. I don't have the milligram per kilogram of body weight in my mind right now to share with you guys. But it certainly does. Typically, one to two cups of coffee within 90 to 180 minutes before an athletic competition will improve your output in most athletic competitions, even cognitive events. Right. It's, it's, it's a banned substance even in competition. In there is a threshold for caffeine. Right. Um, here we go. We answered that already. We get a lot of the same questions, so I got to... Can't sleep after training too late. Post-training meal diet change suggestions. Meal prior to training recommendations. So he's can, after training, he has trouble sleeping. Yeah. Is it his food or is he probably training too close to bedtime? You're too stimulated, too close to bedtime. And we would try and change that if you can. You can try and push back your bedtime if you can. What we do in my house is we shut off all the overhead lights when the sun goes down. We turn on floor lamps and we have a very low wattage of our floor lamps. We start lighting candles in our house and we shut off all the lights that we can. There's no external um, electronic stimulation through our house. Once the sun goes down, then we're not hippies. We're very you know modern error humans. But at the same time, I understand the sleep cycle and how important it is. So we shut off those overhead lights. We start setting the tone in our home to fall asleep and we start creating rituals. That's when book time comes in. Mommy and daddy and, the, and my kids, we all start grabbing our books and we you know, read independently, we read together. That's when we kind of do a little arts and crafts work. We put on our, our jammies and we slowly shut down. This is just my personal experience to share with you. Now, one thing that I does help if we get a lot of you know, self-talk in our brain, what I found to be very effective for myself, for our athletes, and we have a lot of high net worth clients also with a lot on their mind. What I do is I've, I've seen Seinfeld, the series, like, you know, a million times. <laughs> you know, just it's one of, we all have our TV show or a movie that you've seen a million times. So what I do is I take one of my earbuds, I put the earbud in in my top ear, I lay on my pillow, earbud in the top ear, and I, I put on like episode one of Seinfeld. And I turn, I put my phone down so I can't see it on my I table next to my bed. And I turn the volume down so low I can just ba barely hear. I almost have to strain to hear it. But I know every word. I know every scene. I know when Jerry walks in the room and Kramer busts through the door. And I'm in my mind, I'm visualizing and picturing that. I'm typically asleep within the first scene. Every single time. And I'll only switch episodes when I've watched a complete episode. What happens? I'll stay on the same episode for a month or so at a time. <laughs> And what that does, it shuts off my internal self-talk. I've tried this with athletes like Chael Sagan and Vitor Belfort, some of these other guys who have these high-wired brains. It helps us fall asleep like a baby. It shuts off that self-talk. I also sleep like that. I sleep with like an audio book or a documentary. I, I, I have to distract my mind or else I sit there and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you should won't fall asleep. I, I find that's a very good suggestion. Um, what is the biggest nutritional sin that people ignore? Dorian. Uh, there's so many. I would say the... The exclusionary diets are a big scary one for me. The, the, the keto diet, the Atkins diet, the if it fits your macro diet, the um, intermittent fasting diet, the paleo diet, when we start excluding vital micronutrients, when we start excluding whole groups of micronutrient dense foods is a bad thing. Um, going too deep in the calorie deficit in order to lose weight, now we're not taking into consideration body composition. I don't care what you weigh, I care what you contain. That's the most important thing. Um, and I think relying too much on processed foods and synthetic chemicals instead of eating whole foods. We really want you, I, athletes are great, but I don't care about athletes, I care about humans. I care about the biological organism in front of me, and we want to fuel them as such. We want to fuel them to because our cells are constantly dying and replicating. So as we think, I would say, well, what type of materials do we need on the job site? 
We want to keep putting the right vital nutrients of the highest quality on that job site constantly. So as those cells go through that whole life cycle, there's higher quality micronutrients, vital nutrients available for them. That's what we need to be focused on, not counting macros and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, the other question I want to ask you is, um, <clears throat> And we're going to wrap it up because it's been half an hour already. Oh, wow. Let me see. Yeah, it's been half an hour. So thank you, Mike. For sure. Um, what are the top supplements? What are the, the top supplements? Guys who are on the road or guys who are, you know, they can't go to the market and shop the most perfect foods. You know, I, I find that, you know, when I'm run down, that's when I reach for my supplements. So yeah. I, I, eat, I eat, me personally, how I handle it, I eat, is, is, like you said, fresh, um, in season. I try, to, I try to get as much variety and as, fresh, as much fresh food as possible. But sometimes... I'm kind of like, I'm working on everything, I'm feeling a little bit sluggish. I'm feeling like, like the recovery is a little bit lagging behind. And the way I think about it is, I'm missing something. I've yeah. depleted some nutrient, I don't know what it is, so I reach out for my, all my nutrients, my, my, I make a cocktail, I make a, like a smoothie, I put all sorts of stuff, and I, I immediately start to feel better. I don't yeah. know if it's psychological, but I don't, know, I don't take my supplements every day. I take them when I feel run down. And I think amino acids especially. Amino acids for me is, if I had to pick up the number one supplements, it would be amino acids. I'm not, I'm not trying to promote any brand out there or anything like that, but amino acids, fish oil, I don't take them every day, but when I need it, man, I reach out for it. And for me, it does the trick. Amino acids in a smoothie, I put greens, blueberries, stuff like that. I drink that. The next day, the, the same day, I feel better. Yeah. What do, what do you think um, about supplements? We always, well, so we we'll always reach for whole food first, and I'm glad that you said smoothie. So it's a whole food smoothie that you're adding on top of. What we try and do is we try and get our blood work done every 12 weeks maximum. Like no really? more than 12 weeks really? should we go. So we can identify deficiencies with all of our athletes. We can't prescribe supplements unless we know where their deficiency might be, and we first try and fulfill or fill those deficiencies through whole food sources. I know if there's a calcium, magnesium, iron, phosphorus deficiency that we can actually prescribe whole foods to fill that up. And it would likely be through a whole food smoothie, one to two per day. Um, and we have a few good ones that we actually use. So I would go there, I would start looking for those whole food smoothies, not juices, not cold pressed juices, because those are just, you know, really tasty sugar. Yeah, um, sugar. Hey, no fiber. Post-workout, yeah, no fiber, no food matter. We want that food matter. From there, vitamin D3 is, and I work chronically deficient in vitamin D3. I, that's one of the few supplements I do take. I yeah. take 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3 per day, but that's due to getting my own blood work done and analyzed. And I started increasing my vitamin D dense food. And I noticed that I was always in the low end of normal. I live in Las Vegas. My shirt's off half the year in the sunshine. I'm still vitamin deficient, vitamin D deficient. That's when I started to supplement. Something that also is helpful more for longevity is like a, a ubiquinol, a CoQ10. We should all think about that as soon as, especially once you're like 30 years or older, start thinking about a ubiquinol. It's a the more enhanced version of a CoQ10, which is good. Additional vitamin C for general immunity is a good concept to have. Um, amino acid, because as hard as you're training, you know how man how hard Faraz trains. He's always in the gym and training. Here he's training. He's working out when he's not training other athletes. So he's always pushing that hard grind. That's where amino acids would come in. But for amino acids, what I would do first is I would go to a chia seed or a hemp seed in your whole food smoothie, which again falls into the earth grown category very, very dense in amino acids or protein where we don't have to rely on more processed or even synthetic chemicals because that becomes a fine line. There's some good ones out there, but very few, a minority percentage of good supplements out there, supplement companies out there. We always want to fall in the whole food first. A very wide variety inside that smoothie. Lots of lots of greens, lots of color, lots of you know fruits. Also, you said like blueberries and, and lemon. Uh, we want to have parsley. We want to have celery. We want to have cucumber. We want to have kale. We want to have um, chard. We want to have spinach if we can. Um, Whatever is fresh, local, natural, organic, and we want to have those seeds. Hemp seeds and chia seeds and ground flaxseed mixed in there. Maybe a little bit of coconut oil in there. And, you know, blueberries, of course, and blackberries. Whatever we can mix in. That's ideal. Once we're pumping that with regularity we're going to feel pretty damn awesome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then if we can identify those deficiencies, that's that's where the blood work comes in. You'll start to notice trends after three months, six months, 12 months. You'll realize, geez, I'm always running low in iron. Why is that? We pull back, we look at your diet first, and we can see, well, you hardly eat red meat, and we'll just use that because that's easy, you know, dense source of iron. And then we can start to add supplemental forms. Well, I don't eat red meat because of religion or ethics or something else. Then we can look at supplemental forms to replace that. But we always go whole food first, Blood work second, analyze the blood work, and then we can start to fill in those holes from there. What about calories in, calories out? So we see, okay, whole foods, fresh, yep. in season, yep. as much variety of the high, highest density, uh, nutritional high, high density foods. Yep. 
But what about calories in, calories out? Do, should we worry about calories in, calories out? When you're eating whole foods, earth grown nutrients, this is a hard concept for a lot of the fitness experts to understand. The human body actually self-regulates when you're eating whole foods. It's really hard to eat too many calories from whole food sources. It's hard to get fat on whole food. I don't know any, and I've tried. I can't eat enough whole foods. And the biggest complaint we have with most of our diets is I can't finish all this food. And that's a good thing mm. because it's real food, it's whole food, it's micro very filling. Very filling. Very filling. Very fill. And that's what the human body wants. So it's very hard. So it, there's a self-regulating mechanism on that. I use the donut and the apple analogy. One medium regular donut has 100 calories. One medium regular apple has 100 calories. How many people will sit and eat two, three, four, just regular medium plain donuts all day long? Yeah. How many we can eat? Three, you four can't apples? eat five apples. Nobody three grams of fiber. It's too much. Nobody will. You'll feel full. You'll feel full right away. So that's a great analogy, right there. For and people. the sugar is released much slower. This insulin, the reaction to the body is much more tame than a donut. A donut will spike your insulin right away. That's right. And, and when you eat the donut, it's very nutrient deficient. So mm. the body starts craving. I, I need you're hungry more, later. More, you're hungry, hungry later. Yeah, yeah. With the apple, you're good. You're fine. Yeah. So that, you know, I, I, does that answer the question? Uh, it does, but there, there are a few whole foods that I would say can get you in a little bit of trouble. Like, for instance, I think I think 80% of the food whole foods out there, you can't get fat off them. Yeah. However, like, for instance, like dates, yeah. honey, water, uh, uh, maybe like pineapple. I think those high sugar, maybe not so much, but dates. I think with dates, you can, you can gain weight. Honey, especially too. Like, if you're a honey guy, like I'm a honey guy. Yeah. I find that honey is what, okay, it can be, you can have raw whole honey yep. and you can you because it's so sugar dense there's no fiber you could potentially possibly i mean if, if you stay reasonable with your diet if you're if you're if you don't get obsessed with one sugary food that's whole even though it's a whole food you're fine as long as you have that variety and you don't go off balance somehow you know because uh at the end of the day whole, whole foods natural foods they'll never make you fat in my opinion and unless you do something extreme with that diet you start processing them like some, this is, you could you could blend the food in a way you could blend whole foods in a way that could potentially, uh, you know, bust through a, the, the the regular amount of calories you should have. Sure. But if you're actually eating the whole food, to, for your body to break that down and process it, it takes so much. You know, it's so fibrous. It's so because it's so whole, your body won't get such a dense amount of sugar. Yeah, and it's hard. If you can do that in an individual meal, but once you spread it out to multiple meals, multiple days, it's harder to keep overeating whole foods. Now with honey, that's a great point. A tablespoon. Use a tablespoon, and if that's good for you, fine. Is that a good level of sweetness for you? And then we have to be accountable, and we call it mindful eating. We're mindful of, well, why am I eating the honey? I'm eating the honey because I like a little bit of sugar. I like the sweetness, but also I like the, the, the immune-enhancing effect of raw local honey. That's a great thing for immunity. For most people, there are minor allergies to some people, so be careful. But that being said, like dates. Typically, dates, two to three dates, that's all we really need. Two to three dates, 20 to 30 grams of carbohydrates. I have huge fan of dates. I love my figs in here right now. But only two or three at a time, and I also mediate that with some sort of fat source. So when I do have a sugar, I pair it with a fat source, which lowers that insulin output. So I have a handful of macadamia nuts and two or three dates. I get done eating that, and what, we talk in handfuls quite a bit too. I don't like the, the hard measurements. It gets too restrictive on people. A handful of dates, a handful of spinach, a handful of fruit. You think in terms of handfuls. Handful of fruit is an apple or an orange. Handful of dates. That's, you know, it's, it's two, three, four dates maybe held in your hand. It's not a lot unless you're intentionally being a glutton. And this is where accountability comes in. We have to be mindful. We have to be accountable. You know, Coach Feroz can't be leaning over your shoulder yelling at me, nor can I or anybody else out there. It comes, it's you. You have to be the one who's accountable for your losses and for your success because ultimately that's what it's about. It's you. It's what are you doing. All the great, best information in the world is available, but what are you going to do with it? Same thing comes down to food. What am I doing? Two or three dates, a little bit of nuts on the side, eat it, a little bit of water. I'm good. That's going to get you 60 to 90 minutes of beautiful energy, and then we eat again. Another handful and a handful. Another 60 to 90 minutes, and that's where our eat every two to four hours based upon activity comes in, it's all mindful eating. So we don't count calories here, we focus on nutrient quality, which is a massive part of what we do with our, our system. It's very principle based. Because every person listening right now has a different lifestyle, different stress schedule, um, different goals, different physical makeup. But following these principles, like the laws of the universe, they're, they're pretty much set in stone. If you can follow those and be mindful and be accountable to yourself, Health and fitness and performance is, is very, very easy to unlock. 
And then the, the, the minutia, the last 10%, those are the only ones that need to be focused on truly counting calories and paying attention to macros and looking into you know pre and post workout mechanisms and things like that. But those are just the, t the tip of the spear and only for a few weeks out of their year. So you, you get a guy like a, like a George St. Pierre or a LeBron James or you know the world's greatest athletes. They don't have to be so ultra dogmatic 365 days a year. It's really when they're peaking, do they get that crazy? And most people listening, most fans of YouTube and everything else, they only think that they have to be living like that. They think 365 mm -hmm. days, they have to be in that crazy hyper aware peaking mentality, which is wrong. They've actually turned that spear, the, 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 the pyramid upside down. So just being more mindful, being more relaxed with your food and following simple principles is the way to do it. Mm. Mike, thanks so much, man. If they want to reach out to you, if they want to follow your uh, material and stuff like that, what's the best way people can can get more of your uh, nutritional philosophies? I appreciate it. You can go to the dolcediet.com. We have over 1,000 free articles on our site. We also have an online nutrition and diet or nutrition and exercise program completely personalized for you. Every meal, every ingredient, every recipe, every workout set rep with video tutorials. It's a very comprehensive program, but it's personalized to you, the individual. We have a very in-depth onboarding process. You tell us everything about you, and we have a sophisticated algorithm that my team of registered dietitians and internet you know, web experts have created to make sure you have a specialized personal experience, and then my team is there available to answer any question, dietitians on staff, certified trainers on staff to support you. Um, Instagram is always huge. I do a free live Instagram every single day. We try and put as much free content out there as possible to help you guys start moving forward. What's, That's what it's what's about. What's your Instagram? Instagram is at the door. Dolce Diet everywhere, just at the Dolce Diet, at Twitter, the Dolce Instagram, Diet. everywhere. That's where we are. Awesome, guys. I'm going to put that in the description for you all. Mike, thank you so much. Don't forget, guys, Mike has a 100% success rate. All his fighters make weight 100%, never one failed uh, weigh in. So uh, he's, he knows his stuff, guys. I'm telling you, I wouldn't bring you anybody who doesn't know his stuff. So if you guys follow Mike Dolce and follow the rules, you will get lean, you will get ripped, you will make weight. I recommend his, his material 100%. Mike, thank you again. Coach. Super appreciate it. And now we got to bounce. Thank you, guys. And see you all in the next episode. Honor, guys. Thank you. Bonjour. Mon nom est Marc Elie Toussaint. Je suis entraîneur de sprint depuis 23 ans. Je travaille au niveau de la vitesse avec Georges Saint-Pierre depuis 4 ans. Euh, je viens de tester le Tim Tam, c'est le meilleur instrument au niveau du relâchement musculaire que j'ai testé de toute ma carrière. Je le recommande à tous. When you train a lot, you get tight. The best way to loose up your muscle is the Tim Tam. Hi, I'm Jean St. Pierre. I'm using the Tim Tam machine after my training to help me with my recovery.